everybody and welcome back. In today's video, we're going to talk about why you get so gosh darn bloated if you have IBS and what you can do about it. Let's get started. First and foremost, it's important to understand what IBS actually is, and then we can talk about effective treatment. So the name irritable bowel syndrome doesn't actually tell you a lot about what's going on, does it? It just says, hey, you have the symptom of an irritable bowel, but it doesn't tell you anything as far as the pathology or the molecular biology or anything that's actually going on. What they call it in the medical literature and in clinical practice is that IBS is typically a diagnosis of exclusion, which means that you rule out everything else. You rule out Crohn's and colitis and celiac disease and cancer. And if nothing else makes sense, you land at this syndrome, this label, that doesn't actually mean a whole heck of a lot. So we need to talk about what's going on in IBS before we can actually talk about treating it. Now, for the vast majority of people with IBS, and research articles really run the gamut as far as percentages go, but for the majority of people with IBS, they have something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now, this is what I've drawn as a normal gut for a normal human, creepy though it may be. So we've got the mouth connected to the stomach via the esophagus, stomach then goes into the small intestine or the small bowel, and then that finally hooks up with the colon, aka large intestine, before the leftover exits, and then the whole process can start over again at the mouth when you eat your next meal. Now, in this situation, this is a normal digestive system where most of the bacteria, denoted with green, is living in the colon or the large intestine, and there's very, very few. There's just a couple of sparse little spots that represent bacteria throughout the rest of the digestive tract. This is what you want your insides to look like. But if you have irritable bowel syndrome, very, very frequently, you get the situation of bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine. And that bacteria is gonna come from the colon and creep up into the lower parts of the small intestine or sometimes very high up in the small intestine where now you have a local dysbiosis, an imbalance between the good and the bad, and an increased quantity of bacteria in the small bowel where they frankly don't belong. So that is the first thing to know is that IBS usually is actually SIBO. And once we understand that it's bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, now we can talk about proper treatment. But before we do that, we need to talk about what bacteria actually do with our food on a day-to-day -day basis. So here I've drawn ourselves a friendly little critter, some sort of bacteria that lives in our colon or our, our large intestine. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we are going to feed those bacteria food. So I'll just make a pink circle. The food comes in, the bacteria gobbles that up, and then what happens? Hopefully, that bacteria is a short-chain fatty acid producer or a vitamin producer, or it produces something that's good for our bodies, and it's a symbiotic relationship. So in this case, let's say this bacteria eats this molecule of fiber or this FODMAP, and that it makes butyrate for us. That would be really great. But bacteria are also capable of producing other stuff, including gas. And in the case of SIBO, there are three main gases that we tend to think about. There's hydrogen gas, there is methane gas, and there's hydrogen sulfide, or H2S. And if these bacteria produce gas, that's where we start running into the bloating thing and the trouble with IBS slash SIBO. So if you imagine here, for example, pretend that I hadn't drawn the SIBO here. Pretend that this is just a normal colon. If this person were to eat food, again, I'll give it a pink circle, and it makes its way through the digestive tract, basically up until this point, it's only encountered a handful of bacteria, and they may or may not even be capable of producing these gases. So you might have a molecule of hydrogen, a molecule of methane, a molecule of hydrogen sulfide, but it's not enough to really irritate the gut or the nerves or do anything or create pressure. Now, once the molecule of food, say it's a FODMAP or a carbohydrate or a fiber, once that hits the bulk of the bacteria, so in this person with SIBO, it would be right here in the small intestine, some of those bacteria are gonna to start to gobble it up and produce stuff. Some of that stuff is going to be beneficial and some of it is not going to be beneficial. But in this case, let's talk about the gases. If the bacteria located here, for example, starts producing a boatload of gas, that gas has nowhere to go. It's not close to the mouth, so it can't really exit as a burp. It's not close to the anus, so it can't really exit as a fart. 
it's just stuck in this middle part of the digestive tube. So the only thing your body can do to cope is expand. And we get some distension and puffing up of the intestines. And now if that happens throughout a majority of the tube, now that leads to bloating and SIBO bloating can look like you're nine months pregnant. I've had so many of my SIBO patients come to me and say that they've been asked if they were pregnant or they feel like they're pregnant after meals because the bloating is so severe. And it can happen very quickly or it can set in over the course of an hour or two. But this is the problem is that your normal intestine, your small intestine is not meant to deal with this amount of gas. If you were to have some gas production down here in the colon, like say right here, that would be no big deal because then the gas could just pass through a fart and nobody cares. Not, well, the people in the room with you. But if it's here, it has nowhere to go. And the way that it escapes eventually and dissipates is it actually gets into your bloodstream. So very, very slowly, that gas is going to make its way across the gut barrier and into your circulatory system. And then it goes to the lungs and you could breathe that gas out. That's the entire way a SIBO breath test actually works. We're capturing this gas after it gets out of the gut, into your bloodstream, into your lungs, and then you exhale it out. But that takes a long time. It's not as quick as a fart. It's not as quick as a burp. So you're stuck with this gas that's just trapped and making you feel miserable, particularly if you feed the bacteria a lot of food. And this is why too, the bloating can be directly related to the amount of food you feed those bacteria. If you eat one, one piece of broccoli, it's probably not gonna do much. But if you have a whole plate, that might make you bloated. Similarly for other FODMAPs, onion or garlic, if you just have a tiny bit, it might not cause symptoms. But if you have a whole bunch, it could because you're feeding these bacteria a lot more, you're gonna get a massive quantity of gas and therefore a lot of bloating. So there you have it. Now it's worth mentioning too that not only does this cause puffiness and bloating and distension where the intestines have to puff up to accommodate this excess gas, but this also will irritate the local nerves, which let's see, I'll draw blue. You have a lot of nerve endings that go to your gut and innervate or send signals to your gut. And that gas and that puffiness, that irritation will send signals to your nervous system in the intestines and say, hey, whoa, this is abnormal, this is painful, mayday red alert. And now you have an inflammatory pain loop going. And there are also muscles that hang out. They're, they're um, round muscles that go all the way around the intestines, like a loop. And those muscles can get very irritated, especially as they're getting stretched and they don't necessarily want to stretch that much, then they become spasming or spasmodic. And now you have spasming and cramping, you've got pain, you've got gas and bloating, and these are the hallmark symptoms of IBS. And then finally, as far as bowel movements go, most frequently, although this is not a rule of thumb, hydrogen will usually cause diarrhea, methane will usually cause constipation, and hydrogen sulfide is thought to more so cause diarrhea than anything else. But again, these are not rules of thumb. I have had patients with hydrogen dominant SIBO who have constipation and methane dominant SIBO who have diarrhea. But this is basically the whole clinical picture of IBS. You get bloating, pain, spasming or cramping, changes in bowel movements, and it's all dependent on this mechanism of you feed the bacteria, they make gas, the gas gets trapped because the bacteria are living in the wrong dang house, and then it causes absolute misery. Now, that being said, I do not think it's advisable to go the route of, well, hey, if, if feeding the bacteria is a problem, we just get rid of the food, and then bada bing, bada boom, no more gas production. And that's exactly what the low FODMAP diet and all of the SIBO diets do. They're aiming to starve the bacteria, reduce gas production, and reduce irritation via that method. The problem with that is that even if you were to do that, you're not necessarily getting rid of the bacteria not by doing the low FODMAP diet or the SIBO diet, certainly. So if you were to have an onion or have an apple or have one of these high FODMAP foods again, it's just going to come back. You're gonna feed the bacteria, they're gonna produce gas and you're gonna be just as miserable. I would propose that a better way to go about this whole crappy cascade 
is to try to get the bacteria out of the small intestine to begin with, not by starving, but using herbal medicines and using holistic therapies to try to coerce the bacteria back to the colon and do as little killing and as little starving of the bacteria as humanly possible. And what that can look like, the, the way you can get started, is trying to get the bacteria into the colon. So a lot of people in the SIBO world do antimicrobials or antibiotics like Cyfaxin. I've done a gazillion videos on this. If you look at the link in the doobly-doo or go through my channel, I've talked about why I think that you should be weary of becoming a psycho killer and killing too much and relying on that method too much. But sometimes just killing off some of this stuff with antibiotics or herbal antimicrobials can reduce gas production by quite a bit. But the real ticket, what I think actually works the best in all my years of experience is that if we can get these nerves and these muscles to do their job effectively again, and we can regulate motility and regulate the enteric nervous system, that will start to sweep the bacteria into the large bowel and out of the small bowel, and that's exactly what we want. So we don't necessarily have to go on this never-ending killing parade. I've had patients who do 10 or more rounds of Zyfaxin and they still feel like crap. So I can tell you that just killing the SIBO is not enough to really heal. You need to also give your enteric nervous system, your muscles, your microbiota, some TLC, and that will really be effective. One of my absolute favorites for this is ginger. Ginger is an antispasmodic, so it works on the muscle front. It is a prokinetic, so it will help these nerves do their job more effectively. It has microbial modulating properties, so it will tend to inhibit the bad bacteria and favor the growth of good bacteria. So it works directly on this factor here. And it's an anti-inflammatory. So if you're dealing with the inflammation that obviously would come from all of this stuff that you're dealing with, it's also a wonderful anti-inflammatory. It can help you with the fatigue and brain fog and systemic inflammatory response that becomes secondary to this condition. So ginger is one of my absolute favorites. And then of course we could do things like probiotics, prebiotics, other prokinetics. There are medication prokinetics, for example. And then honestly, what we don't always talk about, and I think really should be, these nerves in your intestines don't just go into the ether. They all are going to eventually go back up to the brain via the vagus nerve. So if we can keep your nervous system and your vagus nerve as healthy as humanly possible and functioning at its tip top shape, that's going to be very, very healing for both IBS and SIBO, no matter what your diagnosis is. And this is largely going to go back to herbal medicines, things like ashwagandha, things like ginseng, rhodiola, elythro. All of these adaptogenic balancing plants can help regulate our gut-brain axis, enteric nervous system, and therefore help get the bacteria out of the small intestine and into the colon so that your own protective mechanisms are finally protecting you against SIBO and doing the heavy lifting for you. That way you don't have to over rely on things like Zyfaxin and herbal antimicrobials and you can eat the damn FODMAPs and live your life. Okay, and if you just watched this video and thought, OMG, I don't know where to start. I am so overwhelmed. I've got great news. My online course, FODMAP Freedom in 90 Days, is meant to take out the overwhelm and give you a roadmap to successfully treating your IBS or SIBO so you can reintroduce the FODMAPs and enjoy onions and garlic and, and apples and all sorts of great foods without feeding bacteria in your small intestine. We're gonna talk about things like anti-inflammatories and prokinetics and probiotics and how to reintroduce the FODMAP safely and effectively without symptoms. You do not need to be one of those people who does 10 or more rounds of Zyfaxin or is on the low FODMAP diet for years and years or a lifetime. You can eat the FODMAPs and you can treat your SIBO. You can have your cake and eat it too. I would be so honored to help you on your journey. Link is in the doobly-doo below if you would like more information about the course and I hope to see you there soon. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.